Hi together. Today we have Nikos Kralias from EPFL presenting his paper on neural set function extensions. So let's go with that. The, the paper is about uh, neural set function extensions. So uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, first of all, let me give a quick uh, outline of uh, what we're going to go through uh, in this presentation. Uh, first, I'm just going to give you some um, sort of broad and general motivation for um, for the paper and sort of the broader area uh, of um, machine learning with uh, discrete operations and discrete functions. And um, next, we're going to get into the main idea of the paper, right? And then we'll try to build a bit on uh, sort of the intuition and what are the sort of basic principles behind what we're trying to do. Uh, then we're going to sort of move on to neural extensions, which is sort of the higher dimensional counterpart of uh, um, uh, our extensions. Uh, if time permits, I might get into a bit of background and show you some, some of the math and get a, a little more into the sort of dirty details. Uh, but we'll see how you know, things pan out in terms of questions and uh, how much time we spend. And finally, we're going to go through some uh, uh, experiments and applications. Um, all right, so to start with uh, the motivation and the setup. Um, first of all, uh, we care about, you know, broadly speaking, we just care about uh, discrete computation in uh, neural network pipelines, right? In the end to end, um, specifically differentiable pipelines. And so our main, um, our main objective here um, is to sort of find a way to reconcile, like to make uh, co uh, neural networks compatible with uh, discrete operations, essentially. And this is something that has been, uh, this is a very active area of research in the past, um, I want to say um, seven years or so, maybe. Um, um, this, is, and to give some more concrete examples by, uh, by saying, you know, fusing discrete computation with uh, neural networks, what I mean is learning to, for example, sort numbers, which is sort of a, uh, sort of a fundamentally algorithmic task, or maybe um, finding ways to do sampling of discrete objects differentiably, or things of that nature. Um, now, the, as, as you can sort of see from some of the titles that I'm listing here, um, these um, these works sort of cover a very a very wide array of topics, and it's sort of um, it's kind of impossible to cover all of those things uh, with just one method. Um, so here in our setting, we're going to be in in our paper, we're going to be focusing on a very specific uh, um, discrete computation kind of computation, and that uh, that is set functions. So by that I mean functions. Uh, that take as input a set of objects and produce as output a real number. And so with the domain here, what we mean with this notation is you, we have a collection of uh, at most, uh, we have at most n items, right? And the domain is basically any possible subset of those n items. And this function is going to take that subset and it's going to map it to a real number, right? And and uh, when I say, by the way, a real number, it could also be an integer, it could be, you know, whatever. Um, so for example, we have graph cuts, uh, subgraph volumes, uh, even different kinds of entropy functions and so on. And so um, what, what you need to remember at this point is that we have discrete, uh, uh, discrete input and a real valued output, right? And now usually uh, this discrete input is encoded as you can think of it uh, as binary vectors, right? Uh, so you have so, like this to represent this a set of a set like that. You could have you know an n-dimensional binary vector, and the non-zero entries will tell you which of these n items are included in your subset, right? And so let's look at now a very specific you know setup. Uh, suppose we have um, you know. For the sake of the group here, we have a graph example and also graphs featured in our experiments, so it's pretty convenient. So we have you know, an input graph and we could have a neural network that gives us some node embeddings, right? And that neural network could be a GNN, could be you know, 
whatever um, whatever you prefer, really. And so um, we we get some node embeddings. And now, for the sake of this example, pretend that these node embeddings are um, just you know, let's say the neural network had a, a width of 32, so we would have n by 32 embeddings. And then for this example, pretend now that we also add another layer that projects them down to one dimension. So you have n by one, right? So we have n numbers here. And we want to calculate some, um, some score, which could be you know, some kind of objective function. It could be classification error. It could be anything, really. Right. So when you projected those numbers to n by one, you could even have a softmax because you want to pick, let's say, one node out of all the uh, of all the nodes in the graph or something like that. And now you have this score. Um, now the score itself is a discrete function, right? So that's what we care about here in our setting. So the classification error, for example, or the total number of nodes in the set, or any of those things can be described by a set function, right? And so um, we would like to optimize this. So we have the score, and we would like to find node embeddings that would optimize the score. However, we have certain obstacles now that we have to deal with, right? And those are the, 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 the following three that sort of um, we have to deal with. Um, first is obviously the domain, right? So I told you that, you know, we have this set function that requires discrete inputs, but obviously our neural network has given us some continuous uh, output, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind. A second is um, the gradients with respect to that set function. Um, if, if we're talking about an arbitrary black box function that we don't even have analytic access to, we, we, they're not defined, right? And so we have issues of the domains matching up, the you know, the values of the neural network with the domain of the function, and also the differentiability of the function. We need to, you know, if we want to optimize the score, uh, we would like to back propagate, but if we don't have the gradients, we cannot do that, right? Um, at least in standard sort of gradient-based end-to-end pipelines, just to clarify that. Um, and so, and finally, there's also an issue of dimensionality, which, um, you know, we represent sets, as I told you, with those binary vectors, which commits us to having a single sort of entry for each of those n items and n by one representation. And so um, it, while the neural network representations that we learn in a standard GNN, for example, they have some width, right? We have an n by d representation. Um, and so it would also be nice if we could make the dimensionality match. Um, but let's leave, it, let's leave that sort of in the back burner for a second. And let's focus on the first couple of uh, issues of the domain and differentiability. Um, what we could do here, if we want to deal with this issue, um, we have uh, we could discretize the embeddings so that we get a hard sort of a binary vector uh, here in the middle, right? Um, so we take our embeddings and we discretize either with thresholding or with you know whatever, and then we can apply the score. That is a set function, a discrete set function, and that way now we we are compatible in terms of domain, right? Now we are describing a, disc a discrete set, and this function is compatible with that, so we're good in that regard. Still, that does not deal necessarily with you know the gradient issue, and there are different ways in the literature that you could sort of deal with that kind of uh, with that kind of problem, right? where, for example, you could do stochastic gradient estimation with reinforce if you have a black box function. And you could say, OK, I will sample. I will use those embeddings as parameters of a distribution. And I will sample some sets. And then I will back propagate uh, with reinforce, for example. Or I could do differentiable sampling, um, which is the gamble softmax type tricks. Or maybe if I know something about the function, if I have some prior knowledge, then maybe I, there is a well-known continuous relaxation already that I can plug in. So for example, if you have classification, you know that um, I, I'm not going to train with the classification error. I'm going to train with cross-entropy, right? I'm going to use a proxy. Um, so that's kind of the issues we're, we're, we're trying to deal with here, OK? I hope so far it's relatively clear. Um, 
And now let's let's look at a, a specific example, like the specific example of um, uh, of the graph cut. Um, suppose we have um, a graph, which is this uh, um, the, this uh, figure here in the middle. And hold on. And now the graph cut is a function that we give it a graph, and we provide it also a set of nodes in that graph. And it essentially counts the number of edges that have exactly one endpoint in the set that we have provided for the graph, OK? And so if somebody asks us to find the set in you know, any given graph, um, <clears throat> the set of nodes that maximizes this function, um, this actually is an NP-hard problem. But we could try to you know, find approximate solutions using a neural network, right? And the neural network would try to fit a certain distribution. So that way, we can kind of uh, circumvent the NP hardness issue because we're focusing on a certain distribution and we're not asking you know, to solve the problem on arbitrary instances. Um, and now, how we would go about solving that? Obviously, um, we start with you know, our inputs, like I said, are a graph and a set of nodes uh, that this function requires. And uh, as um, to remind you what I said before, um, we can represent the set as an n-dimensional indicator vector, where n is the number of nodes of the graph, right? And the output of the set, the graph um, cut function is just an integer counting in the number of edges, right? So our setup would, would be something like this: we would have, we would give the input graph to a neural network. We would get some embeddings. We would use sampling. We would treat those embeddings as parameters of a distribution, and we would sample, get some sets evaluate uh, the graph cut on those sets that we sampled. And then in order to do, you know, to differentiably solve it with the tools available as, as they are, you know, in the literature, you could do, for example, reinforcement learning, right? And so you could use the log derivative trick and back propagate using stochastic gradient estimation, basically, right? Um, so that would be a standard way to deal with, with, with a problem like that. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, so sort of to recap, um, I hope now this sort of the setting is very, you know, concrete uh, and to uh, have a, to go over a, a quick overview, we have basically three kinds of categories with which we can deal with, a, uh, with, that sort of, with that sort of setup where we can either do continuous relaxations of the score function in the end, of the set function in the end, right? Uh, and this might this could be great if those relaxations are available because the function is well studied and we know it so for example for the graph cut we know there's also the graph total variation which is which represents it which is you know a bespoke like well-known relaxation for the graph cut that can work very well and it has been used extensively in the literature uh, however we don't get this kind of luxury with all kinds of functions obviously right um and that sort of very straightforwardly straightforwardly can deal with differentiability and the domain of the function. Now, we can also, as I explained, use reinforcement learning, but then it can be harder to train models like that. Uh, finally, we can do differentiable sampling like I brought up, Gabriel softmax and so on, in order to get sets. But then in those cases, it can be trickier to deal with the differentiability of the function. So that's kind of you know the landscape uh, of uh, what you can do right now if you have some kind of discrete function and you would like to optimize it, right? Um, I, I'm sure I'm missing some things here, but you know, for the sake for the sake of um, brevity, I think this covers like a decent chunk of the of, of the literature. Um, so this is where we come in with, and this is the main sort of contribution of uh, the extensions, right? Um, so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna take this discrete set function, and we're gonna define the con a, a continuous function that will agree with this set function on discrete points. And so that is going to be, and that is what we call a, co a continuous extension, right? So this function is a proxy that we define, which, is, which entirely agrees with the original function on discrete points. Uh, and now the goal would be to use, to use this proxy function as a replacement, this extension as a replacement for the original discrete function, right? That's, that's, our, um, uh, that's our goal here. And obviously, 
um, you know, to sort of uh, summarize and keep the, the setting fresh, you know, originally we have this kind of set which can be represented as an indicator vector in n dimensions. That's our set function mapping to a real number. And now our extension will be defined inside the whole hypercube. And so it will take any values within zero to one. Okay, well, I think we have a, a question. Oh, I cannot hear you though. Now? Oh, okay, now I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, so this actually reminds me very much of fuzzy sets. Have you looked into fuzzy sets at all or are you familiar with this? Are you gonna bring up the tricky integral? Uh, no, 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 just uh, okay. like the general, no, no, just, uh, just the general so, like concept, yeah, yeah. There are, yes, so there are some uh, connections and you might, so we don't deal with that and I'm not, you know, I haven't studied this extensively, but there sure. are actually connection to, the connections to fuzzy sets. Um, maybe I can sort of uh, talk about this in like a couple of slides. You will see what sure, I mean. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And so, um, where was I? Oh, okay, yeah, perfect. So the, the main thing now is that we have this function whose domain is the whole hypercube. So it's gonna be an n-dimensional vector, but we can have you know fractional values in there. And now the way this extension is defined is essentially a convex combination of evaluations of the discrete function on a suitably chosen collection of sets, okay? What does that mean now? That means that in this, uh, to evaluate for any point inside this hypercube, we will find some of these corners of the hypercube, evaluate the discrete function in those corners, and then sort of in suitably interpolate them to get the value for the point inside the hypercube. Okay, so that, that's the the basic um, that's the basic premise. Would you you can think of it as just doing some simple interpolation, basically, um, and uh, to remind you here is uh, that we have this property, right? That whenever we end, we provide the a discrete point to that function, so a binary vector to that function, it's gonna agree. Um, it's gonna agree with the original discrete set function, which is precisely the definition of extension. Okay. So um, now, what are the the, the key um, the key uh, conditions here? Um, oh, I should have clarified this, but anyway, it's fine. Um, so the definition is the following is like, like I told you, it's basically a convex combination is a weighted combination of function evaluations, right? That's what this tells us here. And this is just a probability. Um, here you can think of, a, of the alphas here being uh, equivalent to this uh, P of X. Okay, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, I should have just stuck to the PX notation, but it's fine. Um, basically, what we the, the key conditions to keep in mind are the following. We take our X point and we express it as a weighted combination of discrete points. And these are, and this is the notation here. This is what this uh, notation indicates here. These are indicator vectors of sets, right? So these are corners of the hypercube. So we write this uh, X point as a combination of corners of the hypercube. And this combination needs to be convex. So these are positive and they sum to one. Okay, and this sort of naturally also gives us a probabilistic interpretation. So to make it more sort of uh, concrete, you can see those points. Uh, you can see this kind of uh, trick as saying that this X point defines an expectation over certain sets. And those sets are the ones that are in this combination. And the probabilities of those sets are those coefficients, right? That's, a, that's, a, uh, that's the whole uh, point here. And essentially you can view the extension as doing this trick, as taking this F, this discrete function and plugging it in this expectation, right? So that's the main, that's the main trick that you can do. Um, and now I'm gonna get into some more details here. I'm, I'm sure some people might have questions for why this trick is a thing. Um, for now, just sort of trust me that this is legitimate. And then depending on time, I will get into some details for why this is legitimate, okay? Um, so first of all, 
we need to ensure certain conditions, right? That when we define this proxy function, we need to ensure that it's sort of well behaved, that it's not uh, degenerate or something. And um, we like the way we define it here essentially guarantees us the following three properties. And those are, like I said, the extension property, which is, you know, the, by definition, what we're doing. Um, the property too is that you don't have bad minima. So essentially, because you're working in this sort of convex combination of function evaluations, you know that you're never going to escape into a, 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 like in, into some um, degenerate minimum or something. Um, this is basically guaranteed by this convex combination uh, requirement. And finally, property three is uh, we want to be able to also get those discrete sets sort of effectively, right? Efficiently. Um, this should be sort of easy to compute. Um, and that's that part is uh, actually part of the sort of design process of an extension. And I will get to, uh, into this a bit more uh, later. So let me, okay. So to sort of summarize and emphasize the main idea that I need, I need basically to hammer home here is that um, we take, you, we will take this uh, continuous point X and we will find some of those discrete points around it. And then we know that th this can be expressed as a weighted combination. And so what we're doing then is we're saying that the function evaluated at this continuous point is going to be this combination of evaluations at those discrete points, right? That's it. And now the trick for differentiability comes um, from the fact that, okay, if you think about it, uh, if we go back here, Right, this f we still don't know anything about its gradients, so we're not dealing with that. Right, we cannot backprop through that. But this we have control over. This uh, you can see my cursor, right? Um, so we have control over those probabilities. So if those probabilities depend continuously and differentiably on x, then we can backprop through that. So that's the main trick that we're doing. Um, so as long as essentially this mapping from the embeddings to the probabilities is differentiable, we're good. Uh, and we can back probe through that. And furthermore, um, the, the flexibility of the framework is that we can sort of build the knowledge into the sets that we're going to use. Um, so what I mean by that is we know we can know a priori for that a task has certain constraints that only certain kinds of sets are good. And we can actually choose when we do the extension, those sets in order to do this kind of interpolation. This is obviously not possible with all kinds of constraints. In fact, uh, we don't have a characterization for which kinds of constraints we can do with that. And we, we can do with an extension. Uh, but for certain kinds of constraints, at least you can build, you can build them, the constraints into the extension essentially. Um, so we also have some freedom in how we uh, end up doing this kind of interpolation scheme. Um, so let's look now at an example pipeline with, uh, with graphs again. So kind of like um, we produce some node embeddings for the input graph. Again, I remind you that we're on the sort of zero to one interval and dimensional vector. Uh, we will pick which extension to use and we give you multiple ones in the paper and I will go through some examples in the next slides. And these the, the choice of extension determines which sets we're going to use. And then we're going to use a differentiable map to send the embeddings to probabilities. And so, as you can see, we get the embeddings, we get the probabilities here, we calculate this expectation, and then we can backprop now through those probabilities, essentially. So we have a way back in the computation graph. Um, so for some examples of extensions, um, hold on, because Zoom is hiding in my screen. Okay, there we go. Um, so let's look at some examples for uh, for the extensions. Um, first of all, uh, the way we have defined this framework and a well-known extension that is sort of naturally um, uh, included, um, so sort of naturally absorbed is a Lovas extension. And the Lovas extension, essentially, the way it's defined is um, that you, 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 like, you take these kinds of sets, essentially a chain of sets, as you can see here, um, based on the ranking of the elements on that vector, and you compute this weighted combination. 
And now the nice property of the LoFast extension and, and has, you know, a ton of papers have been written on that extension in particular uh, is because for some modular set functions, which I won't get into the details of what this is, but basically it's, you know, at a high level, it's a diminishing return, returns property. So functions who have this kind of diminishing returns property, um, if you take their LoVas extension, uh, you get a convex function. It's, it's actually the convex envelope of the function. And this means that you, then you can efficiently minimize and so on, right? And it also has some nice geometrical uh, intuition. And this, uh, back to the person who asked me about fuzzy sets, um, the LoVas extension is, con is, um, um, is related to what's called the Chokier integral, which I believe has been used for, um, um, I think the LoVas extension it's, itself shows up in uh, decision theory and um, coalition games and things like that. And more broadly, the Chokier integral as well has a sort of a history in showing up uh, in uh, fuzzy sets and um, theory of capacities. And it, basically the applications of those uh, are very far reaching, right? Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you anything particularly smart about the fuzzy set stuff. Uh, I just, you know, my eye has caught that there is a connection with those things. Um, now, okay, so th this is, oops. So this is an example of an extension that is already existing, right? And we also provide some um, additional extensions. One is the bounded cardinality, the K cardinality Lovas extension, which now considers sets of cardinality up to K, which means that let's say, you know, I fix K to be three because I know that in the problem that I'm solving, um, I'm, I'm interested in sets of size three for some reason. Maybe there's a, this is a constraint because the task has some, some, maybe the task has some specific constraint that I care about that wants, you know, sets of up to size three. And so I can, I can sort of build that in the extension and still get the same guarantees and the same properties. And this is one of the extensions that as far as I'm aware, like we propose it here and I haven't seen it before. Um, and another is the singleton extension, which now you only use sets of uh, cardinality one, and those can be useful for classification. Um, and you will see more in the experiments. Um, for now, I just sort of leave it at that, just to give you like a few, a few quick examples. So the, the main idea to keep in mind is that essentially for a given continuous point, there are different choices you can make of, of uh, discrete points that will allow you to uh, do this kind of interpolation scheme. Um, all right, so we do have some time. So I'll do a concrete example now for the LoVas extension because I believe it's probably better to give you, you know, some uh, hands-on experience that this is actually computable and simple to do. Um, so recall that, uh, you know, we're just doing this weighted combination thing. And now let's say we have this vector X, right? Um, and so here, what we can do is the following. Uh, to generate the sets for the LoVas extension, you just look at the ordering of the elements, the, and particularly the, the ranking of the elements. So here, the second, this one is the largest, then this is the second largest, this is the third one. So the sets are gonna be, are, are gonna be chain, are, are gonna follow this kind of chain where you have the first set is just a singleton, the second set has two elements that are the two largest, the two non-zeros that correspond to the two largest elements, the third one, three non-zeros that correspond to the three largest and so on, right? This could go up to n or whatever if you have like a larger vector. Um, and the probability, it's actually very simple to compute. Again, uh, recall that we have ranked our, uh, we have sort of sorted our elements in the vector. So now we're just gonna calculate sliding differences. So first largest minus the second largest, uh, so this is just for the first set. It's this difference, right? Um, and you can do the same for the second one, this minus this. And for the third one, you don't have anything to subtract. So you just keep this. Um, so you get these coefficients. Now, somebody who's uh, a bit more um, critical might notice that these don't, do not sum to one, actually. They sum to less than one, right? Um, but uh, all you have to do here is just say that Essentially, whatever remaining mass there is, you can just offload it, probability mass, you can just offload it to the empty set, so to the all zeros vector. 
the all zeros vector by default, um, you set up the function in such a way that this all zeros vector is uh, its value is zero, so it will not contribute anything to this weighted combination. So um, essentially, you can be content with a sum of probabilities that is less than one as well. That that also works, right? Um, now, uh, here, since there are no questions, I will just assume that this is kind of relatively clear. Um, the reason why this works um, and sort of th th there is more intuition to be sort of given behind this trick. But for now, let's just keep it at that. Uh, if you want me, I, I, I can give you more about this. But I, I hope this sort of illustrates that this is relatively easy to, you know, to compute, right? Um, so now we have th this essentially covers um, all of the first um, the first part of the paper which deals with uh, scalar extensions, um, or uh, as we call them, like low dimensional extensions. Um, now we would like, and this is the sort of dimensionality issue that I hinted at earlier on. Uh, and now we would like to explore how to bring these extensions up in higher dimensions. Um, now, first of all, we need some high level motivation for why would you even want to do that, right? So, there, there are very good reasons to think that working natively sort of in high dimension in high dimensions can be beneficial. Um, one of the sort of most striking examples is the success of semi-definite programming uh, when it comes to approximation algorithms for a bunch of combinatorial problems. And semi-definite programming as to, you know, to give you a very quick um, uh, um, uh, I suppose summary of it is uh, what, what it essentially does is, uh, do we have questions in the chat? Should I? Should I? No, no. I see Can't. there is, do we need yeah, to sort that's... before calculate? Do, do you want me to deal with those now or should I cover them later? Yeah. I wanted to read it out, but I thought uh, there might be a better time. But yeah, I think now you, we already read it out. Do we need to sort yeah. for, uh, or do we need to sort before calculating probabilities? Um, yeah. So basically, yes. But you know, strictly speaking, you you just need. Um, I, I mean, the answer is yes. Like you could try to kind of avoid that, but it's very con it's very simple and very convenient to just sort. Uh, I, I will just say that, um, and the way we have implemented it, like if you if you look at the code, we just do you know we take the arc sort, uh, and we just go you know first larger element, second larger, and so on, and that's how we do the calculations. Um, and to clar to clarify, if the probability is different, would the SI what, SIs also be different? Um, Dobrik, if uh, I'm not sure I understand your question, maybe Hannes, do you have a feeling for what that may? No, uh, I would have just said. Uh, okay, okay. Then that person, if you could please sort of try to give me a bit more, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Or if you want to hop in the call and say something, I don't know. Yeah, uh, he'll raise his hand. Then, or I guess okay. now we have. Basically, it's better if we clear this stuff up. Now, before we go to the high dimensional stuff, before it gets, you know, before too much. Uh... But you wrote another message. Um, oh, yeah. SIs are the sets that are the yes. corners of the box. Yes. The, the, yeah. The SIs are the corners of the box. But what do you mean if the probability is different? The probabilities of those change depending on your point, right? Each point induces different probability. Can you go back two slides? This one? Okay. So actually it's getting super dark here. Hold on, let me get a light because I'm barely visible. I think. Next. Oh, I think that's worse. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have terrible lighting here. <laughs> but Nikos, 
if yes. the, I think the question is like if your your X example would be yes. different, would the SIs like if you have a different input example? Oh yeah, would yeah, the absolutely, ice yes, be different as well. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so every time, because like what happens is that um, each X, like in the Lovas extension, you only have n sets that you're using, right? And so what is going to happen is that for each X, you're going to have um, certain regions that map to certain sets. Um, there's actually more geometry in there, but for now, I can sort of leave you at that, and we can get back to it in the end if you want to hear more about it. But basically, there's a certain simplex that each point in the hypercube maps to, and you use the, the corners of that simplex. And as you move around in the hypercube, that simplex changes, basically. That's kind of the, the intuition. Um, OK, no problem. All right, so Karina, getting back. Karina, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, I just want to, oh, sorry, my video is not on. So um, just like one slide back, or I guess mm -hmm. two examples slide. What yeah. you're doing is essentially just having a bunch of kind of basis and you're trying to read out the coefficient that you add in front of that basis right from like from like right. like in the algebra point of view so yeah. do you require those vectors like is it well you kind of need to have some like non-degenerate condition <clears throat> on the on the vectors to make sure they're all orthogonality right so the, the you're going to be linearly independent here if you choose them like that you're always going to have this kind of um this kind of like a standard flag where basically you have uh, you start with one element. The second the second vector has two elements, non-zero elements. There are going to be ones, right? All of those are ones. It's all so it's basically you can think of it as taking the identity matrix and sort sort of the standard basis and just pairwise adding the the, the vectors of the standard basis. Yeah, that's um, helpful. Yeah, I, I right? just kind of want to clarify for the linear. Yeah. Um, kind of yeah, that's it. So basically, it's always going to look like that. So you're always good to go, basically. Yeah. Um, OK. Should I? Are we good? I think we are. OK, perfect. Um, all right. So um, I was trying to sort of motivate why we would like to go to higher dimensions. And sort of the, the canonical example that I give is that of the max cut, where um, essentially the, the main trick was with semi-definite programming to think instead of just, you know, let's find a set, uh, which set, and that set is represented by um, a vector. Um, let's sort of blow this up into a matrix of embeddings. And let's go and now let's take its gram matrix and do search over the space of positive semi definite matrices. And you have some extra constraints there, but that's like I'm giving you, you know, I'm extremely, I'm simplifying extremely here, but that's kind of the, the main the thrust of it, right? You're, you're searching in the space of PSD matrices, and, this, and those PSD matrices, you can sort of Think of them as coming from embeddings of your uh, uh, of your uh, neural network of, of sorry of your graph nodes, right? And it turns out that some of these algorithms that have defined have been defined there are the best you know known algorithms in terms of approximation ratios. So it's a very natural sort of way uh, thing to to do to sort of go into higher dimensions to, to solve these kinds of problems. Um, in fact, in theoretical computer science, there's a lot of depth to that sort of uh, thing, but that's you know that's another story. Um, then there's also a recent, uh, I would say, wave. Um, some of it, uh, I think, sort of very uh, um, emphatically um, pushed and uh, advertised by Petr Velishkovich and uh, uh, his collaborators' work on. Um, um, neural algorithmic reasoning, where the whole you know message there is try to execute, basically try to execute uh, graph and you know standard algorithms, try to execute them in high dimensional spaces natively with the embeddings of a neural network because you don't want to sort of you want to keep as much information as possible and the neural networks the high dimensional embeddings um, of neural networks have a lot of information and they're very good like feature extractors so you know. 
you try to use as much information as possible, you know, to, to make this as, as sort of as simple as possible. Um, so that's one, and there's also uh, has also been work on the knowledge graphs um, where people are trying to do logical reasoning um, with just embeddings. Uh, so trying to apply logical operators on uh, vector spaces. Uh, and so this kind of like wave of those uh, things, plus the wisdom that we have from, you know, theoretical computer science and uh, semi-definite programming was kind of a motivation for us to take a look on take a look at how could we define high dimensional extensions where now instead of what we worked so far is you know this hypercube what if we had embeddings and you know for simplicity let's just say we're staying on the same zero to one and now we have n by d numbers so basically you can think of this as you know your your gnn it took a graph and it gave you some embeddings n by d and maybe you normalize them or apply the sigmoid or something and you have the, the you have them in the zero to one so that's it right and now you can ask okay can i apply you know the graph cut function or something like that directly to the embeddings that what does that what does that even mean right um and so our sort of goal from now on will be to try to um uh see how we can make that a well-defined um a well-defined question and how we can actually answer it right uh, and so let's see. Oh, does it work? Okay, there we go. Um, so first of all, again, I will. Sorry, I'm being extremely repetitive, but I want certain things to stick. So uh, recall it from the definition of extensions that we have this uh, uh, weighted combination, and we have these probabilities, and we're doing this interpolation scheme. Uh, so. What, what, is that we, what is it that we require if the input to the extension is a matrix, right? Try to remember what we did earlier in the, in the sort of low dimensional case. We found a, a, set, a, a collection of sets of corners of, that, of the hypercube, and we expressed our point as a convex combination of those. Um, and now, can we try to find something similar to do basically in the case of matrices of embeddings is it, is that a thing can we how can we make that make sense basically right and we also need a differential bull map then for the weights of that interpolation that we're going to do uh, so that you know we can sort of back prop back to the embeddings that's the two things that we have to keep track of and the key insights that we have to sort of absorb and this is um, the approach here is first of all, we're going to represent sets as a rank one matrices, just outer products of indicator vectors. Okay, I think that's relatively straightforward here. Um, and so these are positive semi definite matrices. And now these uh, outer products are sort of extreme rays of the PSD cone. So the, the set of PSD, the PSD matrices form a cone. Uh, that's relatively easy to sort of to, to see if you try to write any you know uh, addition down between the PSD matrices, um, and then essentially the rank one matrices are sort of the outer shell of that cone. That's that's kind of how you can think about it, um, and so we can what we can do what we can look for is a matrix inside that cone where we can decompose it as a as a combination. Of matrices that are on these sort of on these extreme rays, like very like very roughly. Okay, that's the intuition here. That's the geometric intuition behind it. Before we had the cube, it was a bit more sort of easy to think about. Now uh, the PSD cone is perhaps not as um, uh, you know not something that that people think about as much. Um, but okay, why does that make sense? Let's let's like sort of quickly look at uh, the math, and you will understand that it's not that not not, not that bad actually. Um, so consider uh, the gram matrix of the n by d embeddings of a neural network, OK? And now, if we guarantee that we have a trace 1 on that gram matrix, uh, we can take its eigenvalue decomposition, right? And now, with the, uh, so these are eigenvectors, these x's here. And these are the eigenvalues, the lambdas. and now, what you can do is essentially you can, because it's trace one, you know that the sum of eigenvalues is also one. 
And that also implies, uh, because it's PSD, that the, uh, the eigenvalues are, are also going to be non-negative, right? Um, and and now remember the key conditions we had originally for our extensions, right? This is what I've been uh, sort of yelling about. Uh, you know, we have this convex sum, and basically, if you look at this kind of the composition we have above, it very closely matches what we're looking for, right? Minus some details. And so the trick is going to be to apply, and this is, you know, um, here I'm going to be sort of intentionally omitting some details, but we're going to apply this trick. We're going to apply the extension, the low dimensional extensions to each eigenvector. So in order to get, to get the extension on the high dimensional matrix, we apply the extension on each of those eigenvectors in this decomposition, right? And the definition is basically going to be, I'm going to ask you to um, pretend that this half, this part here, um, we're not going to discuss this that much for now. Uh, I want you to like fo focus just on the last part. So the neural extension is going to be effectively, it's going to just be, um, approximated by this. So it's now a convex combination of the evaluations of the scalar extension on each of the eigenvectors of the gram matrix of the embeddings. OK? That's the sort of the key idea to keep in mind here. And so um, the probabilities we also calculate in this form. Now, the way this looks with the sets S and T has to do with the mathematical background behind the the way we set this up, but sort of for the sake of making the idea uh, crystal clear here and without having, you know, without getting you to deal with all of the math details, you can just remember essentially that, you know, you take the gram matrix and you can just apply the low dimensional extension on each of the eigenvectors and combine them using the weights as the eigenvalues essentially, right? And now what you end up having, what you sort of need to keep in mind here is that neural extensions, when you do it like that, are built on top of a choice of a scalar extension. So whatever you know, scalar extension you choose to use, you essentially that gives you that gives rise to a different neural extension. So you can have like neural lovas extension or whatever, right? Uh, because you can just apply the lovas extension to the eigenvectors. And now they preserve all of the key properties. Uh, that we have mentioned before. So you have the extension property. Uh, they can also be efficiently evaluated. And basically what you end up paying is the cost of evaluating on uh, the eigenvectors. And so, you know, in practice, what we do is we just approximate the first few dominant eigenvectors and we evaluate on those and that's it. And so while before you would have, you know, one evaluation of a scalar extension, now you evaluate, let's say, I don't know, five of them or something. So you know you have sort of a constant overhead um, on top of the original cost that you were paying. Um, so <clears throat> plus the cost of approximating the eigenvectors, which we can do like cheaply with the par method. So that's a, basically some extra matrix multiplications. In practice, it doesn't end up being that much. Um, so those are the key, thing, key things to keep in mind. And all of the properties that I mentioned before, you know, the extension property, no bad minima, all of that stuff, we get to keep because we're doing essentially a convex combination of extensions. Um, and so schematically, that's kind of, you know, to bring everything together. Uh, we started, you know, from sets that are binary vectors. We went to points in the hypercube, and now we end up landing in this uh, cone um, of positive semi-definite matrices, and particular, and in particular, it's you know it's inter it's an intersection of the of a co of the cone with a with a hyperplane, uh, and now the neural extension property is just that while before you wanted the extension evaluated on a binary vector to agree with the original function, now you want the extension evaluated on an outer product matrix that represents a set to agree with the original function. Okay. Uh, that's pretty much it for uh, the high dimensional extensions. And I notice I'm like 48 minutes in. So now, um, basically, 
uh, well, we're at 556. So if we have some time, I can give you some quick, uh, like a quick sneak peek, sort of a quick sort of overview of how the math turns out, why you can basically do this kind of trick with, by, you know, taking, uh, so doing this, why you could do this kind of interpolation. Um, or I can just sort of skip right through that stuff real quick and just show you some experiments. Uh, I don't know what Hannes, uh, if Hannes has to, is he around? Hold on, don't see him. Oh, you're there, okay. I was um, just getting some power, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, no worries. I, um, I, think, I think we're good on time and okay. uh, I would I would like to go with the <clears throat> with the details. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Okay, so um, good. Okay, where do we? Where does this all come from? Why does this trick even a thing? What is why is this trick even a thing? So as um as an inspiration. We sort of started, I don't know if you remember that I told you the Lovas extension, if the function is submodular, it gives you the convex envelope. It turns out that you can start from that point, essentially, uh, from the convex envelope. Uh, basically, what we do in the paper is that we write this linear program that aims to you know, uh, compute uh, the convex uh, envelope um, in the hypercube. And now, obviously, as you can see here, this linear program is, uh, it's actually pretty, it's, it's by default, it's not something you solve with a solver. What I mean by that is if you see here, you're basically going and look like the constraints are over all possible sets. So you have exponentially many constraints here. So by default, you cannot, you know, just plug it in a solver and do something about this one. But for us, it's just an analytical tool here. And I will explain to you a bit more what I mean with that. Um, and so I have an ex uh, sort of a rough illustration here for the convex envelope. Obviously, if we have a discrete function, you know, we don't have these lines connecting our points. Uh, we would just have some dots in space. And we're just to, we're trying to sort of undershoot the function, right? Uh, and if we solve this to optimality, we get a convex function. Um, obviously, like I said, you know, we cannot just throw this into a solver. So, uh, but it's an interesting formulation because it turns out it can be very fruitful to just study this, right, as an analytical tool. Um, and the feasible set is also known like this, these constraints, these exponentially many constraints, define what is called the canonical or modular poly polyhedron. Um, this stuff has very interesting connections to, you know, I will not sort of get carried away on a tangent here, but uh, I'm just giving you sort of enough uh, info to, um, to think about here. Uh, so, okay, obviously this is bad, exponentially many constraints. How about um, we move to the dual LP? And so we just, we, you know, we can derive it's the dual for this one. And now what ends up happening, what's interesting here is you can see what shows up. So what shows up is precisely um, the kinds of uh, constraints we set up for our extensions. So this is expressing, you know, your uh, continuous point as a point, as a convex combination of, uh, of points, of uh, discrete points, essentially. And this is just what we're evaluating when we're doing the extension. So what up, ends up happening is that this formulation, this dual P, it's just going to give you, like if you just take feasible solutions, we don't care about solving to optimality. If you can just come up with any feasible solution to this in this um, uh, linear program, then essentially you can very um, sort of naturally get an extension out of it. Um, that, that's kind of the, that was kind, that's kind of the building block for the, the, for the trick. So this weighted combination that you're doing every time is just basically saying that you're finding a feasible solution to the, du to the dual of the convex envelope uh, program. Uh, so you can just think of it as just you're trying to uh, uh, like approximate the convex envelope very roughly with, with, with this kind of function, right? Um, so 
like I say here, you know, feasible solutions, uh, naturally defined extensions, and this sum to one constraint is what gives us this kind of probabilistic, you know, interpretation of viewing these points as an expectation, like that this defines an expectation over these points S. And it also guarantees you this non bad minima property because you have a convex fold constraint, right? Um, and now, so once we have that, here's the trick. So here's how we kind of, um, and this ties to the semi-definite programming thing that I mentioned in the motivation. So essentially we know that semi-definite programming is a, you know, a generaliz generalization of uh, linear programs. And basically it's, it's sort of, it's high dimensional, it's natural, it's a natural high dimensional generalization. You can view it like that uh, in some sense. Um, and what ends up happening is what we did in order to define the high dimensional extension is try to like basically write down a, a semi-definite program now um, that essentially has the same kind of formulation as the original LP and, that, and sort of naturally generalizes this LP. There are some caveats here, but the sort of, that's the, the main thing to keep in mind. Now you have this uh, positive semi-definite matrix Z that you're looking for here. And X is our input from the neural network. This is gonna be, you know, the gram matrix that I was mentioning before. Um, and now here again, you're not solving this. We're not plugging it to a solver or anything. This is just an analytical tool, right? So, and now we'll do the same thing as before, uh, switch to the dual. So it turns out that when you switch to the dual, you get these nice constraints again. And you get this kind of formulation. This is the thing that I told you to sort of skip. And in fact, the, the part that I told you about certain caveats, there is some freedom in the way in which you can define this in order like, to properly nail it. Um, but uh, depending on how you define it, essentially you're gonna end up having this kind of, like the constraints are gonna be these basically, uh, where now you have this kind of um, PSD inequality this time around. So now you, you don't care necessarily about precisely capturing the equality, uh, but equality is a valid solution in here as well. Um, in, the, in the sense that uh, when you have this PSD inequality, all that means is that the quadratic forms now uh, on the right hand side, right hand side are, uh, are larger than or equal to the quadratic forms on the left hand side. So that's that's a piece, that's essentially the the space in what the space in inequality tells you. So it's a moreover it's a more relaxed constraint. But if you do you know this, um, but if you just find something an equality there, uh, you're good to go. This 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 holds basically. Um, and so essentially. As before, you know, these constraints, just finding feasible solutions to this ends up being equivalent to the trick that I told you with the gram matrix of doing the eigen decomposition and, you know, developing the, um, the eigenvectors and so on. Um, and here I cannot tell you anything about the optimality, of, you know, of this, like um, um, this is kind of, you know, still up in the air of figuring exactly, um, there are different formulations you can take here. I will just say that, that, I have, that, that I, there's a whole uh, part in the paper in the supplement that uh, a full discussion about what you can do about this. Uh, you can, um, but the, the the point is that this kind of linear and dual uh, and semi-definite and dual, they're not you know um, you have basically some freedom in how to define them. There there is some wiggle room there in how you can set them up essentially. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, but the uh, the key thing to remember is that this sum to one constraint again gives us the uh, expectation interpretation and the no bad minima. Plus, uh, we show that you know if you take feasible solutions, uh, positive feasible solutions from the LP, they translate to feasible solutions of the SDP. So we can we show basically that this SDP is kind of a natural, um, you know. It's not something completely unrelated, but there's actually like a formal connection here with the original LP, right? Um, and that's kind of um, where I stop with this, you know, um, in terms of like giving you the mathematical background behind 
the, the, the trick of this interpolation trick, it all comes down to this uh, convex envelope formulation for the LP and it's sort of uh, SDP counterpart. Um, and now we can look, if that's okay, uh, we can look at some uh, uh, experiments. And so we have some experiments for combinatorial optimization. And this is just, you know, you have some cost function and you have some constraints and you're looking for a set that minimizes this uh, cost function subject to that set being also a feasible set, like obeying the constraints, okay? Um, and what we can sort of very straightforwardly do here is just take the cost function and take the constraint and combine them into one set function, write them down as one set function, compute its extension, and then just optimize, just backpropagate. And that's a, like a very simple way. So you don't have to worry about, you know, whatever this function is, you can just relax it like that, basically. Um, and so we have some results here. Um, so the, these are uh, finding, these are the problems of finding the maximum click and finding the maximum independent set. And what's going on here is that the numbers you see are mean approximation ratios over the, over the test set, essentially. And that means that, you know, the closer to one you are, the better. Um, so you have mean and uh, standard deviations over the data set. And so the sort of main takeaway here, um, or at least the one I would like to sort of emphasize is, first of all, in terms of comparing to reinforce, which is, I guess, the most, um, I guess, comp uh, the most related perhaps or relevant comparison to make because reinforced can be applied to any function kind of like extensions. Um, so with, with respect to just reinforce, um, we're competitive and we're beat, beating it in uh, most cases um, uh, with, the, with the neural extension, in some cases, even the scalar extension. And then there's also the case for um, Erdos, and this is a previous paper that uh, I did with Andres. Um, and this one gives you a very particular formulation and you can sort of see it as a, as a special case of an extension plus some additional loss function design, right? So that one is tells you a specific way for how to generate like loss functions for certain kinds of objectives. Uh, and so also we're doing better than that um, uh, for the maximum click problem, for the maximum independent set, not so much. Uh, but again, you know, I want to emphasize like we're comp like we're competitive there, but in some cases um, this does clearly better. Um, but here again, you know, I want to emphasize that uh, that uh, that paper, um, it's sort of assumptions can work with certain kinds of functions. Basically, it's not a generic black box. Uh, you cannot use it basically as a generic black box differentiation engine or something. So. Um, finally, the, you know, the, the nice thing to note here is that also the neural extensions can consistently improve over the scalar ones. Uh, in most cases, uh, we can see like, in, in, like, for example, if we look at the maximum independent set, uh, uh, in some cases it, it was borderline, uh, you know, uh, the scalar one was not doing anything, it was a very poor performance and uh, by go using the neural one, then all of a sudden we have um, actually something like decent. Um, and so in many cases, it, it's you know beneficial to go to, to use the neural one. So just do the gram matrix eigenvector trick. Um, so that's one application. So combinatorics is one thing you can sort of blindly apply this to as a, um, as a rule of thumb. And Let's look at the specific case for designing uh, um, sort of specific extensions based on the task. So for example, if you, if, if you give me a graph and you tell me find clicks of size three, the Lovaz extension um, could have, well, technically the, uh, these vectors have to be, you know, as, as uh, their dimension has to be the size of the nodes, the number of the nodes in this graph, right? But, you know, for simplicity, sort of bear with me here. Uh, I, you know, it wouldn't fit well on the screen if I try to like uh, put a huge vectors here. So 
Uh, but the, the, the main thing to keep in mind is that if you do the Lovaz extension, you will end up having sets with cardinality much larger than three, right? It will go up to n. So a lot of those, if you only care about sets of size three, you don't need them. Like they, they, they will be invalid solutions. Um, and so um, you can sort of naturally say, okay, can we do better than this? So this bounded cardinality extension that we proposed um, is uh, essentially allows you to bound how, the size of the largest set there. And now what will happen is you will have, you know, this staircase thing where you have one, two, but then it will cap at three. And then all of the sets will be size of three, the rest of the sets. So that way you can sort of explore the space of, you know, cardinality three sets uh, more effectively. And indeed, when you do this, you can see that, you know, if we choose the K lovas, which, you know, for K for the values indicated here, um, we, we, do, we do better at finding those kinds of clicks um, instead of the, the naive, let's say, not Lovas extension. Um, and also this doesn't cost much more. Like it's basically the same kind of extension. Um, finally, as a completely different kind of approach, uh, as a completely kind of uh, something, I guess, uh, less expected is you can even do image classification <laughs> for this sort of thing, uh, with this sort of thing. So, you know, um, we can just say we have an input image uh, and we have some class probabilities. And then here we would have to, you know, discretize, do the argmax, for example, right? And take the class label and plug it in and get the training error. Um, but if we want to train this, we're going to use, you know, the cross entropy and so on, you know, some kind of differentiable proxy. Instead, what we're proposing here is that, oh, you can just, you know, take the training error and do its extension over a singleton sets that are the labels and use this as a training proxy instead of the, of the um, cross entropy, right? And the nice thing when you do that is that, as you can see here on the left, is that the loss function kind of tracks nicely with the accuracy. So uh, with the training error, sorry. So um, basically what happens is, um, you know, if you use the cross entropy, the cross entropy may or may not exactly match how well you're doing in terms of accuracy on your training set, right? Uh, but this one sort of closely tracks. Uh, so it gives you this kind of nice, I guess you could say, interpretability of what's going on as you're training where you know that Roughly, the score you're getting is the you know the uh, the, the kind of error you have for your uh, uh, training set. And in terms of test performance, this ends up being slightly weaker than than cross entropy, uh, which you know I thought I should mention because I'm not claiming here that we're beating cross entropy or you know or anything like that. That's you know tried and true. Just keep using cross entropy. I'm not against that. Uh, <laughs> But it's just sort of an interesting way to rethink a classic, you know, problem. You can just, you know, take that discrete function and uh, and relax it to using our extensions. Um, and so that's basically what I want to go over with the experiments as well. And finally, for future work, I just figured I should put some, you know, bullets. Maybe somebody cares about this or not. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, so. Can we identify, so in terms of the theory parts of, the, of that work, can we identify perhaps um, conditions for, uh, um, for the extensions such, as, such, such that we know that they're well behaved when we're doing optimization? So the way, like, is, is there some kind of thing that we should ensure for the mapping from node embeddings to probabilities, or perhaps how we generate those sets that can give us some kind of, you know, certificate that the function uh, that the extension is going to be well behaved when we optimize because we don't give you that here we're just giving you a way to do it but we cannot guarantee to you that any plug any function you will plug in we're gonna uh, like it's gonna work well right um another is can we provide guarantees and by that i mean uh, for neural extensions and by that i mean we know for example that the lovas extension uh if this function is a modular it gives us a convex function right could we do the same for the neural Lovas extension? Um, and it turns out it's not like easy to answer this. Uh, it would be nice. We weren't, you know, we weren't able to prove that here. And as far as I know, there are some uh, 
uh, math people uh, in the US that are trying to figure out a, a semi-definite sort of Lovas extension. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting problem. Uh, it can lead you down to, down to very interesting sort of uh, uh, literature. And finally, what kind of constraints can we sort of characterize? What kinds of constraints we could build into extensions? Here, I will conjecture that sort of matroid constraints might be the, the limit of what you can do. And I will give, like, I have no proof for this. I, just, I haven't even worked out the math well or anything, but just as a sort of um, little nugget of uh, perhaps uh, if somebody finds like something interesting in that, I bring it up. Um, finally, in practice, where else could we apply those extensions, right? I showed you that we can do combinatorics or we can do, you know, uh, classification uh, for images. Are there other applications? I've had some people at NeurIPS tell me about uh, natural language processing. Some people brought up generative models. Some people even told me like uh, VAEs. Um, I'm not sure. Um, this is, you know, I, I hope the audience has some ideas about that. Uh, it could be interesting to see if somebody can apply this stuff to something else. And finally, except for just improving the loss function, like instead of just coming up with a loss function in the end, can we also use extensions at different parts of the pipeline? So for example, could, you, could we use extensions to, let's say, extract features from a graph and, and like get some features and use those, extract them sort of differentiably and train end-to-end -end, uh, with those features, like where those features can be, you know, size of certain subset cuts, uh, like cuts of certain subsets, or volumes of cert or certain subsets or, or other sort of discrete quantities that you might want to measure. And you might want to do this on top of embeddings or something in an end to end way. Uh, so maybe you could figure out a way to get the extension and use it for some other downstream task instead of just using it as a loss. Um, and yeah, that's kind of all I had to say. Um, um, that's uh, good stuff to say, and we have some. We have questions, yes. Questions in the chat, I think. And yes. the first from, from Dobrik again. Uh, no, no, you you go and read it out. Yep. So it seems that correctly picking the underlying set function uh, scalar extension is the was the bread and butter. It was even used for building the neural extensions. Do you have any guidance on how to build a good a good set, uh, scalar extension? Or is it up to intuition? Um, this, unfortunately, a lot of it is up to intuition. It's and it's also up to um, like like I said before, um, each extension could, like sort of commits you to certain kinds of sets. So, for example, if you have this kind of diminishing returns property in your function, if you know that, or empirically you notice that, or something then maybe it's a good idea to think, oh, okay, this function might be submodular or close to submodular or something. So maybe I, I will use the Lovas extension because I know in that case that the Lovas extension is gonna give me a convex function. So it's gonna play well with some modular functions. But if I have a cardinality constraint, let's say I'm looking for sets of at most a certain size, then it might be better to just use this bounded cardinality constraint uh, extension, right? Or if you want to do like some classification thing and you're picking like one hot uh, vectors, just do the singleton. So it's kind of like it is intuition and also it's kind of how it matches. Like maybe then if the scalar doesn't work at all, maybe you can try the neural on top of the scalar, right? Um, so, but I don't have, you know, I, I could not give you, I don't think there's a one size fits all kind of answer here, unfortunately. Like it is a lot of, understanding the context, what kind of function you have, understanding what sets your extension gives you, and trying to figure out what is a good match between which sets would I like to sort of use when I optimize, right? Um, that, that's, that's, I think, the most important consideration. Uh, and then another question is from the same person that also another clarification, can we again reiterate, if time allows, given probabilities and the uh, uh, the extension, how do we compute the supporting set S? Okay, yeah, that's fine. So in fact, let's go back and look at the example real quick. Um, here, um, sorry. Okay, here just 
what you need to remember here is everything is done by the ranking of the elements. So just keep in mind that this is element number one, element number two here, and element number three. That's how you index them. And so when you go and generate sets, you will generate one set at a time. And each time, you add an extra non-zero entry. You just add an extra one to the vector. So you start here from the top element, the maximum, element number one, and you start with a one. Then when you go to the second, you go to the top two elements. So it was this and this, right? So you will have one and one. And now on the last one, you just have everything. But you can imagine if you had like you know a bigger vector, you would start you know largest element. Then in the second the second set will be first largest and second largest non zeros. Third set, top three. Fourth set, top four, and so on. Um, that's kind of how you would you can think about it. Um, does that make sense? Maybe. So and this is so depending on the rank, like basically depending on how these are ordered, you get different sets. Um, and the intuition in, in, in that is that basically, like, if you want me to give you a little bit more, uh, like any uh, hypercube, you can partition into n factorial simplices. So that, that's a trick, right? So. What happens is if you have n factorial simplices, you have one simplex per ordering because you have also n factorial orderings of the vector. So here, these simplices are going to be triangles, right? Um, technically, they're going to be like tetrahedral or something because you have the zero, all zeros vector as well in the mix. But um, like uh, basically, you can think of these as like corners of a simplex each time, and the simplex is determined by the ordering. Um, so, um, if what this means is like, let, let's say you're like in the top half of the cube, this commits you to a certain simplex in the bottom half to another simplex, that sort of thing. Uh, and because each time, depending on where you are, the, the, the ranking of the coordinates changes because, you know, your Y axis might, will be bigger than your X axis or, uh, or the other way around and so on. Um, does that make sense? Maybe. Um, he's not answering, so I'll take that as a, I don't know, maybe yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, <clears throat> I think he'll shoot, shoot, a mess, shoot a message, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, feel free to, you know, obviously uh, contact me. Uh, and as a last thing, I forgot to you know, obviously plug our stuff in the end. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just want to say. <laughs> yeah, um, so just, you know, there will be, so there is code. Uh, I'm like reorganizing the repo a bit. The code is already there for the Lovas extension, for all of the extensions, for everything. But you know, instructions and those things are being written right now, so they're coming soon. Um, but you can run the code already and everything. I'm just and just need to polish the repo a bit. And there's also a blog post that explains um, some of the stuff here, all of the scalar extension stuff without going to high dimensions. Uh, I wrote a blog post on my uh, website, so you can also check that. And I try to go, you know, I try to take it like very slow, one step at a time there, and try to emphasize just the important stuff. So hopefully that's also useful. If like if the presentation wasn't like, maybe you got confused somewhere, maybe the blog post will be more helpful. I don't know. So feel free to check that as well. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's I kind of. I think that's a that's a good idea. And finally, I also now know what your Twitter is. Uh, I thought you didn't have a Twitter. <laughs> no, no, I follow you as well. <laughs> um, then uh, the future tweets will include that Twitter, and uh, yeah, everyone else yeah, can, fine. I guess, also go check out these Twitter handles here. Maybe yeah, go follow Josh as well and Andreas and Stephanie. Um, yeah, some some future ICML submissions for example then you'll you'll probably hear about the archive version um, about that's of that soon from these guys so yeah it's it's worth to to stay updated with their work i guess and yeah uh, i i want to now quickly say a big big thank you to you yeah. um because super nice presentation 
super nice paper and yeah thanks for making it so accessible for us and all right all right thank you thank you very much i hope it wasn't like too boring i hope there was something of interest to people there um uh, uh, hope the math wasn't like too annoying or anything so uh, much, i uh, if anybody was... you know ha has questions still you know shoot me an email or write me on twitter whatever you like um, I, I th admittedly i think i was i was lost at um small parts but mm -hmm. as you said the, maybe the the important things still got through and uh, um what i to also took away from the paper is also uh, in here I... all right okay perfect <laughs> all right thank you very much again for the invitation and yeah thanks everyone for the questions and your attention all right, a big thanks to Nikos Karalias for this presentation and thanks to all the, the attendees for, for asking these nice questions. If you want to ask questions yourself next time, then the information is in the description, like the Zoom link and so on to, to join the, these sessions. And also we have our Slack channel there where you can vote for papers, stay updated with everything, or you can find our mailing list or calendar to, to join these sessions in the future yourself. All right, then I hope to see you next time. See you.